is Hani. I'm very, very happy to be here, and I really enjoyed your talk. And we should talk over lunch. <laughs> um, very happy to be here today. I want to talk about mindful design. Um, I think it's a topic that I've been getting more and more involved with recently, and it's something that I find myself being very passionate about. Um, my name is Hani, and I am a digital addict. Before we go on, I would just like to show you a video first, then we can come back to this. Architects of our digital world, stop, be better, because we can be. And we can see that these systems have been designed with intricacy so that companies can keep our attention indefinitely. I don't want to keep crushing these freaking candies. I don't want these alerts to completely command me. I don't care if that panda bear is dancing. Well, maybe with a hula hoop. Okay, this is fantastic. I have to share this with my 10 friends and 10,000 strangers. Caption, who wants to throw a panda rager? Great, let me go back about my life. For God's sakes, I'm trying to right swipe my wife. Huh. 30 seconds and just two Facebook likes. Or is that just two for which I've been notified? Let me go back and check inside and see whose likes I tried to hide. They don't show them all, I wonder why. This panda is dancing. And another video plays after automatically. This one of a gopher that stage turns dramatically. It's like my attention is kept systematically raptured by algorithms that know exactly what I want. Or not what I want, just what I'll watch. And the people behind this intelligent design genuinely want to better our lives but their bonuses just so happen to be tied to keeping time on site exceptionally high. And now even my news apps have been gamified, and what am I not gonna click that one simple sex tip guaranteed to blow her mind? Wait, where was I, and why have I forgotten to look for that thing I'm supposed to find? And my God, look at the time. It is shocking. But somehow, yes, Netflix, I am still watching. And I know, I know. I should have more self-control. But just to be clear, you just spent a million dollars telling me this story designed to cut off at the end, leaving me wanting more. See, of course I want to see what you have in store. See my cursor already waiting there on the screen floor as you tease the next hour in all of its glory. And you'll give it to me unless I actively abort. See, it seems the decisions already made for me. The countdown clock's moving. There it goes. Five, four, three. I need to sleep but you made me want this more. This is not what I consciously signed up for when I hit play on one episode six hours ago. Architects of our digital world, you have more data, information, and control over our retention, the tools to tweak our emotions so we'll return to your experience, but is that what you should do? Or should you? Build digital tools so advanced they can actually enhance the world outside the device in our hands. Can you add so much value that it lets us put our phones back in our pants as fast as we possibly can? Not time sucking, time giving innovation. That's what it means to be truly technologically advanced. The future is not all screens. It's humanity in hand. give credit, this was done by a guy called Max Tussle for um, a movement called timewellspent.io. And I urge every single one of you to check out, after my talk, check out timewellspent.io because I'm trying to cut down on my references to it, but it basically signifies all I'm trying to express today. Again, my name is Hani, and now that you know what I mean by being a digital addict, please, by a raise of hands, who of you is guilty of at least one of these things mentioned in the video? Do not be shy. <laughs> cool. 
I guess it speaks for all of us. It's, it's, it's so expressive that it just it might have been me in that video as well. Um, so today I'll be talking about mindful design. I'll be talking about digital addiction. I'll be talking about all these small ideas that popped up in the video, but what they sum up to in whole. Um, I'll be very honestly talking about something that I spent the better part of my career working unknowingly against. I always worked for you know how to engage users, how to get them to stick to our apps, how to send out more notifications to bring them back in. But then at some point, yo, I, I, I just feel bad about myself being uh, 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 you know, uh, just targeted by all these notifications and all these intrusions and all these distractions that at some point you just realize that we have to take a stand and we have to start really thinking about the future and what this means to our lives in the future. Um, simple fact, today's mobile phones have more computing power than NASA had to land on the moon in the 1960s. If we want to go in numbers, 64 kilobytes of memory versus up to 256 gigabytes of memory on the iPhone 6 and operated at 0.043 megahertz versus 2.3 gigahertz, which is 2,300 megahertz. Says a lot, but of course, what we end up using this great technology on our phones for is the following. <laughs> Amazing. So quick questions. How many times do you guys think you check your phone per day? Hundreds, numbers, anyone? Thousands, Thousands for you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. So there have been um, different studies about this. Some claim 80, some claim 130, some even claim 150. I'm going to stick with the average, but still 80 times a day, just taking out your phone, looking at it is a little too much, I would say. On top of that, we each receive, on average, 50 to 100 push notifications every day. And it takes us 23 minutes to refocus after each distraction. And it's not just that, but studies also saw, this is done by um, a woman called, where are the credits? Uh, Gloria, Mike, uh, Gloria Mark at UC Irvine. She says, she found out that after each distraction we get, we need 23 more minutes, 23 extra minutes to refocus. And after that, after each hour of interruptions, we tend to self-interrupt even more. So if you interrupt yourself or you get interrupted three times, in one hour, the upcoming hour, you're bound to self-interrupt yourself even more. So looking at all these numbers, you know, number of notifications you get per day, how many times you check your phone, the time it takes to distract, like what do we end up looking like? I don't know what's happening. I really like this um, art project by this photographer called Eric Pickersgill. What he did is just takes photo of regular everyday interactions and he removes the phones from the situation or the tablets or the device. And you see how we end up looking every day. These are the friends. This is the couple. Oh, the family over dinner. And then the kids. And like, there's something fundamentally wrong that if you ask a machine or a phone, what do humans look like? We're going to look like one eye, two ears, and one finger. <laughs> so what is this all about? It all boils down to something called the attention economy. And how, um, so the founder of this time well spent movement is called Tristan Harris. Um, the guy sold a startup to Google a few years ago, you know, the San Francisco dream. He sells a startup to, to Google. He works there as product manager. And then at some point he realizes, you know, this is, this is not right. So he left and he starts doing time well spent, which is a move, um, it's sort of a movement um, trying to bring awareness to this particular topic, trying to bring awareness to tech companies and designers and developers onto how to design and how to build products that actually, you know, tailor to the human condition and not just drives the human condition. So he calls it the attention economy. He defines it as a race to the bottom of the brainstem. It's a whole group of companies and startups and organizations just trying to take control over our, I'm not saying it in a conspiracy theory, theory kind of way, of course, but like they're really trying to take over the time we spend um, on other devices or on other apps or on other solutions and how to bring them, bring us to their solutions and how to take over our basic emotions of fear and need and pleasure and so And this is all very simply manipulated by a smartphone. Um, so at again, the attention economy, what is it? By simply reading these words right now, you guys and me, we all, all our minds are inhabitant of the attention economy right now. So because when you wake up in the morning, you check your phone, first thing you do, your mind is instantly jacked in and then you suddenly think the, the things you are thinking about are things that a few tech designers in California got your mind to be thinking about. 
So this is exactly the attention economy. How do I steal this person's time? So he spends time looking at the screen, watching whatever I, it is that I am providing. So whose fault is it anyway? <laughs> I love Mark. No. <laughs> um, every single social network's growth and revenue um, depend on how frequently we and every one of us checks the screen. So they hire teams of neuroscientists, of psychologists, of engineers, who all work and hack around just to build services that are laced with dopamine just to keep us hooked. Um, you, you have to, like, I've been noticing recently so many uh, 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 redundant features on different apps. For example, we always had you know, Netflix, you finish watching an episode, it auto plays the next one. Now you even have that on Facebook, even in the app. You finish watching one video, the next one starts playing. Now they have a feature, I think, on their website that if you're watching a video and you start scrolling, the video pops up to the corner of your screen so you can keep watching while it's going. Then it ends and another one starts. So autoplay videos, disappearing stories on Snapchat and Instagram, um, they're all programmed to achieve the same goal, right? Um, that you either don't leave or you keep coming back to it as many times as possible. Um, which is why I would simply say that it's not our fault that we are hooked on apps. They are designed to do that. They are specifically designed to have us get addicted to these apps. Um, so I would like to talk about the biggest source of distraction, basically, which are notifications, and what these notifications do to the human brain. So one, they get us in dopamine loops. They get us addicted to instant gratification. Uh, they get us exposed to an excess of information and exhaustion shorter attention spans, and context switching. I'm going to be jumping into each of these individually. So for dopamine loops, um, over a period of time, dopamine loops is basically um, simple pleasure or simple so that you check a certain app or you check any sort of news. You get a notification. You get excited. That's a dopamine loop. And what happens with the brain is that the more dopamine loops you get, it's very similar to drugs, actually. That the more you get, it's, n it's no longer a tolerance thing. The more you get, the more you want. And at some point, it's just not doing it for you anymore, that you're not getting satisfied. You just keep checking and keep checking and keep checking. And you're never going to get to a point where you're like, ah, OK, cool, I checked it. It's going to keep going over. So in that way, it's designed, in a sense, to keep you trapped. A very simple example would be when you change your Facebook profile picture, right? Uh, we all do that. And I think Facebook is pretty smart enough to recognize that at that particular moment when we update our profile picture, we're a bit socially vulnerable, I would say. So they make it a good point that in their algorithm, they break it all the way up to the top so you, it gets more exposure, so more people would start engaging with the photo. So you get more likes, you get more comments, you get more feedback. And it's giving you social approval, but at the same time, Facebook knows that's the way to grasp you and that's the way to bring you back in. And it's also very similar to slot machines. And that's how casinos operate. That slot machines, you know, you're just sitting there and you're tapping a button. You either win or you don't win. And the, the, uh, basically the attractive force behind the whole thing is this unpredictability. If you know you're going to keep winning, you're going to get bored. If you know you're going to keep losing, you're going to get bored. The way they do it is that you just play. And at some point, you're going to win. At some point, you're going to lose. And then you keep coming back. Um, the next point would be instant gratification, which is a great thing. I mean, everything is a click away. We love it. We have on-demand services. We have cars. We have laundry. We have food. We have um, even medicine in certain cities. You get them delivered to your house on demand. It's great. But, you know, the more we get used to this, the more we tend to start expecting similar services or similar instant grat gratification in other aspects of our lives, in our careers. You know, we want promotions, we want raises, uh, in, your, in your relationship, in, in basically any kind of aspect of your life gets affected by instant gratification. That's just not healthy. Um, information excess and exhaustion. So. Again, um, dopamine is um, simulated by unpredictability, like we mentioned before. So when something happens that is not exactly predictable, it stimulates the dopamine system, right? So most of the content that you see is aimed towards capturing your attention, but not really towards teaching you anything or giving you any value. And that's the biggest issue with news online today, is that you keep getting headlines versus headlines against headlines. And you never get one complete story. And you keep clicking on these headlines. It's a developing story. And you barely ever learn something new. It's more a way for them to keep bringing you back in 
So you spend more time on the website and you spend more time on the app and you get to see more ads. Um, so yeah, clickbait, that's another way to do those. And let's not go there, but fake news, right? <laughs> and um, I, I love this comparison because, you know, everyone said, you know, back in the day, we always used to socialize. People used to talk. Look at these kids these days. They always have their heads in their phones. But I mean, you have photos of people in trains and buses and everyone's in the newspaper, right? But the difference, I guess, is of the quality of what content you're getting when you're reading the news from a newspaper, which is like one finite story, A to B, you know how, where it's going to start and you're going to get something out of it versus updating stories and just going on and going on and going on where you're never really getting any extra information. Shorter attention spans. Um, so the internet, <laughs> I love this. I wish it could animate. I don't know why it didn't work. Um, the sor shorter attention spans, like I mentioned before with, with um, the distractions that we get, with the notifications that we get, it's just really affecting us to a point where there are certain studies that have been doubted, but some studies say that the human attention span is now shorter than a goldfish attention span, which is at 9, and humans are at 8.5 but there are lots of you know, scientific wordings around that that don't make it very accurate. But you can rest assured that our attention span has gone down. And you can look at yourself, look at how many times you switch apps. You're just browsing you know, mindlessly in Instagram, then suddenly without noticing. I think it's sort of a, 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 a muscle routine. If suddenly you jump to Facebook and you're scrolling, you're like, where am I? Oh, back to the video. Um, and then finally, context switching. Um, so say you're working on some important document at work, and then some colleague sends you a notification that he needs another document to be sent to him. You're like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. You do that, you get into a whole 23 minutes of distraction thing. And then right after that, you get a message from a, from a friend who's chatting with you. Hey, what are we doing tonight? Are we grabbing drinks? And you're like, yeah, drinks, come on. So we start talking again. And this just puts so much effort and so much, uh, requires so much energy from the brain that you are focusing on so many different things at such little time, and you're always jumping back and forth from one topic. You can never focus on one particular thing or one particular activity that is just too demanding, and it's always going to take you 23 minutes to get back. So what can people do to fight digital addiction? What can every one of us here do? And I've got some hands-on experience with this, because it's something I've been trying to you know, trying to figure out how, how I can cut down the time I spend on my phone, how I can cut down the time I spend browsing Facebook endlessly for, for no particular reason. So there are so many different techniques one could try. You can try, first, simplest one could be removing apps. You know, Facebook is spending, I'm spending too much time on the Facebook app, I'm just going to remove it. And I did that a few weeks ago, and I'm happy, to be very honest. But I still see myself going to my browser and just like mobile on Facebook. Like, oh. <laughs> but it's definitely way better than before. I, 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 you know, I leave that to my desktop. I've even removed notifications from almost all apps unless those that require like immediate attention, such as WhatsApp, email, just one of the email accounts, and Facebook Messenger, because I know that's where my family gets in touch with me. I know that's where my friends get in touch with me. Um, there are so many different things you could do. I've done this other thing. These are all things I just researched online. There's this thing where they tell you that the first screen on your phone, the first app screen, is just for the tools that, or the apps that you really want to um, get into using something that gives you benefit, like learning a language or, or listening to music or so. And other tools or other apps or services that just have a very clear functionality that you just step in, you do what you need to do, and you're out, like checking the weather or, or similar things. And then you start moving all the other apps, all the distracting apps, you move them to the next screen, and you start putting them in folders, and you hide them. And I have that on my phone, but... It works for the first two days where you're like, oh, where's everything? And then you know where everything is, and then your fingers are just going there automatically. There's another way of using apps that actually time which whatever it is that you're doing on your phone. So you spent nine hours on your phone today. Three hours of those were on Facebook, two were on WhatsApp or so. And these are great. They give you, like, they quantify all this time that you're spending, and they give you a better idea of all the time that you're wasting. But they're never going to get to a point where radical change that stopped happening. Um, one thing I would like to add is this one app called Space, which is amazing. The concept is um, you get a replacement icon for Twitter, for WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, Snapchat. And what it does is you just download the or you install it, and then you get these replacement icons. And then every time you want to open one of these apps, which, is tradition which are traditionally known to uh, take more of your time than other apps, 
is that it gives you a screen like this and it asks you to meditate for a couple of seconds before you go in. So you know, you're checking into Facebook fully consciously and knowing what you're gonna get yourself into. So that's great. And then you wonder like, hey, how, is, how come this is not on everybody's phone so far? Why is nobody using this? And the sad reason is because the app got rejected from the App Store, <laughs> honestly. And one App Store review reportedly said, one uh, representative from the app store, Apple App Store said that any app designed to help people use their phones less is unacceptable for distribution in the App Store. <laughs> so this gets you to the point where you start believing like, hey, this is something like we have so limited power to do something here. What exactly is it that we can do? Um, in my opinion, it's not going to be, I mean, there's always individual responsibility or individual initiative or what you can do or what your preferences are. I see myself not being too interested in Facebook. I just removed the app. I spend more time on Twitter now, but I control who I follow. And I know that, you know, you follow people who are sharing interesting stuff. You follow websites within my domain. So it's better controlled than Facebook, I would say. But in my opinion, the responsibility lies on the companies. The responsibility lies on the designers, on the developers, on the engineers, on the business people that we have to start you know, standing up and taking a conscious stance that this is really ruining each and every one of our lives. And you see this happening to us gradually. When the phones first started coming out, everyone loved, you know, I'm all over the place. You can write me here and I'll call you there and then just send me a photo and I'll do that. Now everyone, like nobody wants to talk to anybody anymore. You just want your space. So what can be done? What can we do from a business perspective? A bunch of things. One could be as part of the products that we build or the services that we build, that we build them in a way that enable users to set up boundaries and give users control over what notifications they want to get and at what time they want to get them. No FOMO, no fear of missing out, reducing friction, building something to assist and not to take over people's lives and adding a value to human life and society. So to get into each of these in detail. Um, helping users setting up boundaries. Um, this could be achieved by example, for example, by Netflix asking us Saturday morning, hey, how much time do you want to spend watching TV this weekend? Four hours, five hours, fine. And then when the time is up, it tells you your time is up and that's it. So that's you know, one very radical example, but that could basically describe the point itself that the companies itself, the services, the services themselves could be also assistive and could, be also, could also take an initiative at trying to help people take control of their time. Um, that's pretty funny too. So everyone, you know, this is a, uh, um, swipe to refresh or the pull to refresh. Like, hey, didn't you check that 10 seconds ago? Really, you want to do that again? Didn't get any new email from Donald Trump or anyone important, so we could just get back to work. You know. um, something has missed here. Sorry. Yeah, so giving users control over notifications. Um, one concept that I saw proposed online by this Tristan Harris guy was a focus mode for Gmail, which means that, you know, right now I'm in my focus mode, I'm working, I don't want any distractions, I don't want to receive email. And so if someone is sending you email while you work, he gets an uh, alert like, okay, we're going to queue that, but I don't know, Simon is busy, he's only going to free up at 12. And then you know that, okay, I sent him what I need to send him. Simon's not going to be distracted by it. When the time comes, he's going to get it, unless it's something super, super, super urgent. And you can just say, no, like, this is really, really pressing. And then it would go through. And then you would know that it's super pressing for you to check it out in the first place. And Slack has actually implemented a similar feature that you can control what kind of interruptions you want to get and how to, how to block that. Um, fear of missing out, uh, that's something we all suffer from. I would say. I mean, I never got that until, you know, you just at some point you're like, well, I actually I do I do suffer from fear of missing out. You know, uh, some things we could do is like Facebook, for example, could let users turn off their um, uh, news feeds or timelines during certain times of the day, and there are plugins for Chrome, if I'm not mistaken, that let you let you do that, where you no longer see anything on your timeline. Um, and numbers, numbers is actually a very engaging element when it comes to design, when it comes to um, neuroscience that. Uh, once you quantify things, when you see quantity, you want to see more. So if you get one notification, you want to get the second. If you, wanna, if you get two, you want to see three. If you get five likes, you want to see 10 likes. So if you just have a badge that says, you know, update or alert or just a red badge instead of having one, two, five, ten, whatever, 
that is definitely going to have people come back less and have you go back more, go back less, actually. Um, reducing friction. So every time I think of this point, I suddenly directly think of service design and what that means. And when you think of all the different touch points that you have with the system, and when you have, think of all the different interactions you have across your user journey, it also makes me think about automation and innovation in the sense that consider the current user journey that you're designing for your, um, for your users or the current user journey that your users take and look at all the different touch points and look at all these different parts or all these different instances that you can just remove or you can just automate or you can just do in a way that you do not require any user input or any user interaction and hence you're reducing the time or the activity spent by the user himself. Um, identifying user steps and actions, again, and innovating and optimizing on old journeys or old processes. <coughs> My favorite example here would be the Disney Magic Band. I think this is one of the coolest innovations to come out the last couple of years. It's, it cost Disney, I don't know, a couple billion dollars, and it's basically all you need. You get this when you go to Disneyland now, and that's all you need. You're going there, everyone knows, you go there to, to Disneyland, you go there with your family, you want to have fun with the kids, you want to just have some good quality time with the family, and you don't want to spend time worrying about keys or key cards or money or where are the kids, oh, the other guy got lost. And, and what it does is that it has everything you need to have on your wristband. So you get it, as soon as you get there, it has your ID, it has your name, it has your um, money, or at least not your money, but um, it, it runs a check for you. So everything you want to buy, everything you want to pay for, you just tap your wristband and that's it. You want to get into your bedroom, you tap, you tap your wristband, that's it. If you get um, priority passes for some roller coaster, you just walk in with your wristband and that's it. And they even had them for things like Uber payments. So I think it's pretty cool. Like it's really, if we take one step back and look at that whole uh, uh, how to automate and how to reduce steps and how to reduce friction, this does it and it does it so elegantly and so seamlessly that you know, I don't have to think about which digital app do I need to use or uh, which physical element do I need to have on me to be able to access this writer. So I'm there to have a good time. This is all I need. I don't need to think about anything else. Um, building something to assist and not take over. So we're at a point now, um, we have so many buzzwords, you know, ambient technology, Internet of Things, no UI, all that stuff. But this all actually makes sense. It all ties into one another and it makes sense that um, we're getting to a point where we no longer need screens for many, many, many functionalities. We're getting to a point where technology is all around us. It's ubiquitous. And why not leverage that? Why do we still need to take out one brick from our pockets that, you know, just like swipe and scroll and find me that and do this? I don't need that. What we should do with, the, with technology instead is that it should be the slayer that we have in our lives that just comes into play when it needs to come into play and then just leaves us be when we don't need it there anymore. And to do that, we can do that by leveraging technology. We can look at um, the sensors that we have in our phones. We can look at APIs. We can look at um, data that we get from our IP, for example. And like YouTube, it's a very simple example. YouTube does something like that when, based on your connection speed, they automatically figure out what the connection speed is, and then they adjust the resolution of the video according to your speed. Um, so for example, this is a list of all the sensors or output APIs in the iPhone 6S that we could all leverage in our designs and in our projects and actually automate many of the processes we require from users to do on tap or on screen now. And this is the 6S, like, I don't know, I think we're seven, the new one is coming out in a few months, so pretty sure there are way more sensors now than there was in this diagram. And even the camera. Even the phone camera could be used as a sensor. And this is a use case that's becoming so common now that whenever you want to scan a card, a credit card, or you want to enter your credit card details in the Uber app or in the PayPal app, you no longer need to type and just look at the small digits on your card and type it again. You know, just point the camera at it, it extracts everything, and it's automated. It's there. Data. And this is, this is, this is life-changing for me. I, I run my whole life on Google now, or whatever it's called now. Um, Google now just basically taps into your, to, to your services, taps into your email, your calendar, understands your patterns, your routines, and just in a, in a, in a fine way, you can, you can control what it gets. And just gives you like non-intrusive, very timely 
notifications or alerts that, were with, that would help you right now or in the very soon future. So Google now knows, for example, that every Monday after work, I go to basketball. And when there's traffic, Google now just tells me, hey, honey, you might, as, you might leave 15 minutes earlier today because there's traffic just to make it on time to basketball. Otherwise, it's, hey, don't forget basketball at 7 today. Leave at 6 to make sure you make it on time. Same thing happens. I, I, land in, I land in Bristol. I get you know, currency exchanges. I get told how to say you know, good morning in English rather than German, although I can barely speak any German. Um, so it gives you like really timely, really helpful small bits of information or data that would just ease your life at this point or just assist you at this particular point. And finally, add value to human life and society. You know, my favorite question is, do we really need an app for that? And we have like a plethora of apps, like for apps for everything, and they're so redundant that at some point, eh. you know, the average number of new app downloads in the US is zero. The market is so saturated that you barely download any new apps. You download some, you delete them, you don't use them. The ones that you use, you use, and they're just established, right? But what this means is that I'm not saying let's, let's say no to all sorts of technologies or all sorts of apps, but let's be a bit more mindful about what we want to build and what its effects are on society and human lives. I currently work for Volkswagen, for the car company, and you know, it's, it's one of these high-risk situations as well because when you're designing digital services inside the car, you know, whether on the screen or in a heads-up display, you really need to be mindful of what you're designing because people are actually driving a car. You cannot give them information. You can't show them ads. You can't show them, you know, check this out, uh, recommendations, and so on. No, people get into accidents, and accidents are dangerous. So augmented reality in, in the automotive field, for example, is something very promising and something that's going to be very, I'm pretty sure when this comes out and when it becomes established that when you look at fatalities and numbers of car accidents caused by similar distractions or so, and when you see that after AR is out there and established, I think there's going to be a huge slump downwards that it's actually going to save more lives than any other technology has, within cars, of course. Um, another thing is health tech, and that's, that's something I'm very passionate about. That's why I really enjoyed your talk, again. And um, one, of, one of the apps or one of these startups I, I advise in Berlin, um, it's a health tech company, and they're building a solution or they're trying to build a suite of apps, they're currently focusing on IBS, on irritable bowel syndrome. And, you know, for someone to download such an app, you know, it lets you track whatever you're eating, how you're feeling at this particular time. Do you have any pain? Do you have any bloating? Um, and then just at some point realizes what is it that causes you these annoyances and what is it that makes you feel unwell and starts rec giving recommendations instead, personalized recommendations. And this is something that has no generic solution or no generic therapy or treatment from a doctor. You can't just go to a doctor and tell him, hey, I have IBS, so I'll just take this pill. It doesn't work. Every person has very specific things that's going on in his body. And this app is so simple that you just go in, you track whatever you're eating, how you're feeling, and that's it. And when I look at the numbers, like I'm, because I was with the guys a few days ago, and I'm still so impressed by it that it's picking up like crazy, the app. You don't need to spend your whole day on it. You go in a couple of times. You know you want to check the app because you know you're getting benefit out of it. You're not just going there to go through videos, to go through to more content and just, you know, just surf endlessly. The engagement numbers, people are spending around two, three minutes per session, but people are using it every single day. People are using it every single time they're supposed to use it, and they're getting great reviews on the app stores. And some of the reviews are, you, you know, you're getting five stars on the App Store because you're not taking too much time. It's not taking too much effort for me to operate this. Um, and in closing, um, I like this quote by Sophocles who says, um, or who said, actually, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. But, um, you know, we're all tech enthusiasts here. We all work in technology. I don't want to bash our own industry. Technology is one of the greatest things to happen. You know, the, the internet is one of the greatest things to happen to our, to our human lives. But I believe it is our responsibility to put technology in the back seat. It's our responsibility to keep humans in control. It's our responsibility to make sure that technology is here to assist and not take over our lives. Um, I believe, really, that this will be one of the next challenges to come up in the next coming years once everyone starts realizing that, hey, my phone is taking over my life and you know, I need a better solution. And I think that's a great challenge for all of us designers and all of us engineers sitting here 
and in our domain to tackle very soon. Um, and before I close, I would also recommend, um, again, checking timewellspent.io. It has a lot of what I've been discussing here. It covers the same topic. Um, it has some action steps that people can take too as well um, regarding doing design or building products, but also regarding what we can do or what, as a community, we can voice towards the bigger players, towards the Facebooks and the Apples and the Googles to let them start taking things into this consideration. With that, I would like to thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 12 times. <laughs> and yeah, don't forget to like, share, tweet, follow, and do all that stuff. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you.